I'm super excited to have uh, Robin Lowy today that has joined us uh, to talk about her Game Changers book. And uh, both Google and Gaglers uh, are happy to welcome you. And I know she's going to give her life story. So uh, without further ado, Robin, thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Gosh, what a pleasure. What a pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, let's see, I wanted to just start out with uh, a quick introduction. My name is Robin Lowy, as she said, and um, I started this blog called Apocalypse Smart Lesbian Commentary about eight years ago, just inviting uh, lesbians to like tell their stories, and um, I publish events and just interesting things, authors, things like that. So it kind of led me to the book. But before we get started, I wanted to just ask your advice about um, about my Halloween costume. I had two choices. One is the clowns, and these are clown candidates. It says, you know, vote flappy and crappy for Congress. That was pretty funny. So we tried that one on, and we tried on the cat costume. So which, which do you think we should do? Clowns. Oh, you like clowns? That's so good. So they scare people, anyway. I like to be a little scarier than, you know, I don't know. Anyway, so. Um, OK, yeah, maybe we'll do that. So this is the agenda today. We're just going to talk a little bit about me and um, a few other things. You can take a look at that. And we have some good giveaways. OK, so growing up, I didn't have any role models, really. Um, it was a pretty scary time in the 60s and 70s. And when I first moved here to California from Chicago, I was about seven, and I rode my Stingray around. It looked just like that, actually, and without a shirt on until that just wasn't okay anymore. And what, what we did was, um, what I did was like beat up boys after school. Um, we'd sneak out at night. We were just trouble, my friends and I. And, you know, it became evident early on that, um, that I really liked girls and I was just, um, I, would, I would stand in front of the mirror and like flex my muscles and um, I had two ideas in my head that I was sure about. One, that I was never going to marry a man and two, that I was never going to have a baby. So those things ended up, one of them ended up changing. <laughs> but I was so, I couldn't have been more sure of anything in my life. Now, I also was a big Sandlot uh, softball player, baseball player, and I wanted to play Little League so bad, and I was really good. And um, at that time, this was pre-Title IX, if you can imagine, they, they didn't have to let girls play. So I wasn't allowed to play. Um, so I joined Bobby Sox softball team, which um, was called the Great American Girls. And we had a coach who was kind of a butchy mom type. And we, we all had big brothers, and we, we played so hard. We were sliding into home and saying, you're no batter. And we handily won the championship, and then at the end, when they were passing out the trophies, it ended up that they said, I'm sorry, but the great Amer American girls are disqualified. We're going to give the trophy to the Buttercups uh, because they, the great American girls did not play in a ladylike manner. So if you can imagine a time when it was not OK to be competitive or a tomboy. Um, so that was the message I was getting, pretty loud and clear. OK, so then when I became a teenager, I applied to be the, a park ranger. And I became the first park ranger. This is a shot of me with a current park ranger that I ran into. And I didn't have to wear the man pants and the man boots. At the time, I could wear like cute tennis shoes and really tight pants, like the kind that you lay down and zip up, um, and a big old shirt with badges and a big key ring. And I just thought that that was so cool. And I would stand around daydreaming about the girl I was crushed out on. Um, then I got to high school, and I really tried hard to be straight. Um, I, you know, I had a very feminine look, and I just, I got a lot of attention from men, and so I just didn't know what to do. So I tried really hard, and it didn't work. Um, when I got to college, I went to a summer in um, Europe where I met another woman who was also um, had never been with a, a, a girl, and we both were stumbling around. It was a very awkward time, but we got through it. <laughs> and then after that, I finally moved to San Francisco, where I finally found my people. And we lived on Castro Street in 1982. 
I met this woman and we started a family after about seven years. Um, we each had a boy. My brother was the donor for the older boy. And then she couldn't get pregnant again the second time. We wanted to and so I had to step up and it was terribly difficult as an athlete to be pregnant. And that picture on the bottom is my son and I. We look exactly the same. I, I gotta say it's one of the most emp empowering things that I've ever been through, like an Amazon, like to give birth, like here I was a little kid thinking I can never do this and um, it ended up being really awesome, I except for ruining my body and <laughs> he cried for five years straight, pretty much. <laughs> um, <laughs> But when he got a little older, and it was cool because I couldn't have really had a baby with a man. I, I wasn't really that great with infants, and my, my ex-partner loved to just stay home. She, I worked really hard. I was so happy to go back to work, and she took care of the infants. And um, so they're really good kids. So then at this time, we had to, this, okay, we were the first wave of parents. Um, other people ha were having children that were older than us, but there was no real group of parents. So we were in San Francisco at this time when we had like a gay PTA and we had a very inclusive campus. Um, and it was just, it was nice, you know, but, but we still had to do this thing where we adopted each other's kids because we couldn't be legally the parent of our own child, or, or I couldn't be the legal parent of her, the child she gave birth to and vice versa. So we had to literally give up our children to each other and the judge would just, I remember we had to go to court twice and he would just like point at us and say, are you sure you want to give up your child? And I'm like, oh my God, it was really intense. Um, and then we got married. We uh, went down to City Hall, Gavin Newsom made it okay to go down and we ran down there. And um, it was exciting and my, my youngest was eight and he was like, oh yay, this means you'll be married forever. You'll always be together. And unfortunately that wasn't the case, but what happened that was cool about that was that he, you know, he just felt so validated by us being able to be married. So I, I feel like that's such an important, um, it's just an important thing when you think about um, the whole right for same-sex marriage, that, that the kids are the ones that are being hurt by it so much. And so we um, got our uh, marriage certificate mailed back to us after about I think it was less than a month later, it arrived in the mail as annulled because the law didn't um, stick. So then at that point we moved to Marin County. Um, that's where I grew up, as you saw, and I, I wanted my kids to have a more rural existence. So I brought them to Marin and my oldest came home saying, uh, God, mommy, why is everybody saying you're so gay, you fag? And he just didn't understand, it was shocking for him. And I was like, well, we're not living in San Francisco. It's not a bubble anymore. So he became uh, the kind of kid who told his friends, look, I'm not going to be your friend if you say stuff like that. And, you know, I, I don't know. I got, I got motivated to go into the schools and become a speaker for the LGBT Speakers Bureau, to be a coach for the Little League team, to be the coach for soccer, and just be visible and, like, help them. I mean, like, things would happen like I'd have kids over for the soccer party and I'd say, Timmy, what are you doing out there? And he'd say, oh, we're, we're playing Smear the Queer, you know, what, you know, in the backyard. I'm like, what? And, you know, so it, and it just went on and on. Some of the dads would say, wow, you really remind me of Ellen. And I'm like, why? I don't look like her. And we just had, um, there was a lot of homophobia in Marin. And, and, and I think about all the people in the outlying areas right now. I mean, we live in such a bubble. Um, so I got the idea to write this book, which is about lesbian heroes of my generation. And, and the women that they looked up to weren't, it wasn't like they were bad, it was just that the role models weren't very positive. So they, they passed a law called the Fair Education Act kind of recently, and it really um, got me excited. Like this was something that I could contribute to. I could, I'm a graphic designer and an editor and a curator, and I, I have a huge circle of people that I know. And I, I just thought I can make a really fun book that teenagers are going to love. And so um, what this law does is it requires uh, LGBT education uh, as far as history and social studies in the public school curriculum in California. And there's right now, there, it's not really like the curriculum exists. It's not like really there's resources for them. 
um, I, I attended a symposium last week where, or two weeks ago, where we, we um, got in a room and did a whole big think tank about how we're going to get this to happen. And um, it's clearly a couple years out before there will really be a lot of things available to students. And especially public schools don't have a lot of uh, resources to spend on stuff like this. So I got it in my head that I wanted to make this book and donate it to uh, the public high schools in Marin, San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley. So what I did was I decided to go crowdfunding. And I got to say, if you're a little insecure and you have a full-time job, this is a brutal way to go. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, it was so excruciating. I went at it, two, two different runs at it, each for about 10000 And um, no, the money's not all from my family. It really did get spread out amongst about 200 people at an average of about 100 each. Um, it required, you know, live Facebook videos, you know, yay, you know, so scary. Um, anyway, so I got all that money, and then I was able to print the books, and I was able to deliver them to the 48 public high schools, and it serves about 49,000 students now. And these schools have invited me in to talk in their classroom. I've been able to um, just share with these kids and hear their stories. And I had one girl come up to me just in tears saying, oh my god, I can't believe you're really here. And she had, um, I had these books kind of sprinkled around some bookstores too, like in the Castro. And she said, I got your book in the Castro and I'm, I'm just, I can't believe it. You know, and she was hugging me and crying. It was like so gratifying. Um, so I wanted to show you my crowdfunding video. Let's see if I can get this to play. My name is Robin Lowy, and I've been curator and editor of Apocalypse Smart Lesbian Commentary for the past six years. As a pioneering lesbian mom with two grown sons, I turned to my youngest, Sam, age 20, to talk about what this book means to him personally. I was raised in Marin County by two lesbian moms. As I grew up and went to elementary and middle school, I noticed that we were never taught about gay people or their history. So because of that lack of education, gay slurs were rampant around campus, and it was always kind of a struggle for me. I think it could help not only heterosexual students that are unclear about what being gay really means, as well as kids that might be coming out of the closet and just want to find their own place in the world and be accepted and loved. If you could spread the word to your network, it would be a great help. So thank you so much for your time. Anyway, um, I asked him to say that in his own words, and he kind of gave me a hard time. He's like, I'm not going to, I don't, mommy, I don't know what, you know. And, and I was like, oh, no. And then I just, it, and then one day he goes, OK, I'm ready. And I just went outside and filmed him with my iPhone. I got pretty lucky there. It's a good boy. And he's not, he's, yeah. Anyway, so then I also got books ordered from schools and libraries all over the um, United States. People were hitting me up in like North Carolina and Texas and um, it was just, it's been super exciting. I'm down to my last few books which I brought for you guys to raffle off so you're pretty lucky. Then I won a, an award for the best LGBTQ book by this um, Next Generation Indie Book Awards which was quite a, it's quite an honor and I really didn't understand that it was such an honor. I was kind of like, oh, I got this award and then someone told me I've been trying to win that for years. I can't believe you. <laughs> anyway, so here's a, a brief history of queer culture. I just want to back up a little bit and talk about um, that the women in the book, these are, this is the kind of world that, that, they, that I was a little girl and they were little girls in. This is what we had. OK, so there's Sappho, who obviously was the first uh, written word of a sonnet t to another woman that is arguably like the beginning of lesbianism. And then Radcliffe Hall came along in like 1929 and she um, wrote a book called The Well of Loneliness. It was, uh, it was in the court system in the UK for a long time for obscenity and it finally made it to the US. Um, there was no explicit sexual content in this book whatsoever. It was just that there was a mannish heroine who was, I guess she liked girls. I don't know. And then Gertrude Stein was in the 1930s, she was the first visible lesbian here in, in America. Um, she was from Oakland and she wrote those famous quotes, a rose is a rose is a rose and there is no there there in regards to Oakland. And um, she ran a salon like in Paris with people like F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway, Matisse, uh, Picasso, all these big thinkers at the time would sit around and, 
And then she got famous for writing the book about her partner, Alice B. Toklas, uh, called The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, which is kind of random. She, she did it in the voice of her partner. Um, and just as an added fun fact, uh, my parents named our cat Alice, and then later it came to light that his name was, her name was Alice B. Toklas. This is when I was a little girl. So that happened. Okay, so then this genre called Pulp Fiction emerged, and it had to do with just cheap paper. That's why they called it Pulp Fiction. And it was the first time that America could buy just uh, paperbacks cheaply at a newsstand. And you know, you might finish reading it and leave it on your, on your seat on the bus, and someone else would pick it up. And so it was, it was just a way to get masses to be reading literature. And, and then within that genre became lesbian Pulp Fiction. And oh, my notes. <laughs> Did you grab those for me, Jane? Anyway, so um, if you wrote this book, a lot of times the women had pseudonyms that were men's names. And you, the publishers required that you um, had to say, you, you literally had to have the heroine either die. These are not them. <laughs> it's in my bag. Anyway, back to, um, oh, back yeah. to the lesbian Pulp Fiction. So, um, you had to have the heroine either die, go back to men, or go crazy, just like the films at the time. It was, it was, this is what we had to look up to. This is what we saw. Yay! <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Okay, so um, I want to just read you a quote of a woman who's a kind of an interesting writer. She's probably 80 now. So she said, a lesbian pulp fiction paperback first appeared before my disbelieving eyes in Detroit, Michigan in 1957. I didn't need to look at the titled for clues, the cover leapt out at me from the drugstore rack. A young woman with sensuous, sensuous intent on her face, seated on a bed, leaning over a prone woman, her hands on the other woman's shoulders. Overwhelming need led me to walk a gauntlet of fear up to the cash register. Fear so intense that I remember nothing more, only that I stumbled out of the store in possession of what I knew I must have, a book as necessary to me as air. The book was Odd Girl Out by Ann Bannon. I found it when I was 18 years old. It opened the door to my soul and told me who I was. And it led me to other books that told some of us who we were and how some of us lived. So it, just to imagine a time where this, something like this would be so forbidden and so awesome to like not have any vision of yourself out in the world. And then, then you got this kind of one that wasn't so great because you didn't have to die or go crazy. So in this one, things started to change a little in the 50s. Women's barracks actually was about um, a real couple with a real relationship a little bit. And so it, it came under the scrutiny of the uh, House Un-American Activities Committee, where they, um, they had it up for obscenity. And they, they said, lesbianism was a sociological disease and a cause for grave national concern. It could not be cured, but it must be understood as a tragedy. So it was accused of promoting mor moral degeneracy. This is because they crossed that line where they weren't having an unhappy ending. And, um, I mean, I'm actually not sure about the ending, but the fact that there was a real relationship was just too much. Um, this is it's kind of the McCarthy era, too, or a little later, but anyway, but it, it helped really increase the sales, and they sold like four million copies of that. Uh, <laughs> so this other book, The Price of Salt, this was, did you see the movie Carol that came out a couple years ago? This was the movie um, with Kate Blanchett, I guess, and this was the movie that they wrote it about. And that one ha sort of had a happy ending where the women got to stay together. She lost her child, but <laughs> it wasn't all rosy. Anyway, so during that same time was the underground gay bar culture. And um, I guess it's saying that gay men and lesbians were now seen as a group to cure, convert, and suppress. So the American public started to get wind of this thing, and they, got, they were getting really mad. You can't be out in public. and. So they were rounding up people. This is around the time of Stonewall. Um, so these women here, you know, it was a very butch and femme culture. And like, you, if, if you, you could get caught for not wearing three um, things of the same, three articles of clothing of the assigned gender that you wore, you could be thrown in jail. So I'm not sure if I would be thrown in jail. Hopefully not. Um, but they had little signals, like they'd flash the lights and everyone would switch to the opposite sex partners so that they wouldn't be like thrown in the paddy wagon. But they were risking everything, their jobs, their lives, their families, just to be able to congregate. Now, at that same time was this thing called um, a couple different secret societies, Daughters of Belitis. This is Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin. And their thing was that they were kind of the intellectual set. And they didn't really want to be 
associated with like the working class butch femme scene. They, they wanted to um, be able to have a literary magazine they could send around. And so they sent it in like a brown paper bag. And um, so people all over the country were getting some culture now, finally. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about my game changers in the book. So the way I set this up was I chose women who uh, are not famous in the world at large. They're famous amongst the gay and lesbian community. So we have authors, businesswomen, promoters, actors, publishers, entertainers, lawyers, everybody that I could gather together that was connected to me on some first or second degree um, that was willing to give me all these pieces I needed to pull this book together. So you don't see people like Ellen and Rosie O'Donnell and stuff in here because they're already famous. But it's, it's more like our heroes that actually created real changes to the culture for the young people today to know about. Um, so this woman, uh, Monica Palacios, she was named, um, they had a Monica Palacios Day for her 30-year career as a Chicana lesbian uh, performer and writer. Uh, this is Judy DeLugatz. Um, the, she um, is the Olivia person. So sh they started Olivia in 73 as a music company, and then now it's like a multi-million dollar corporation. And um, she's doing really well. And, and you know, I've been on a lot of these trips, and I always find it fascinating. Women from across the country that don't live in our bubble save up all year long to be able to afford this one week to be able to hold their partner's hand and be out for a week. It's, it's incredible. I, it's, I always forget just how lucky we are here. Um, and this woman, Crystal Jang, is really interesting. Each person had a page also that had a, like a pull-out card, which I'll show you. But Crystal, um, she was born and raised in Chinatown. And as a young woman um, in the 70s, during that time, the health department was sending people out to different communities to talk about, wow, there's gay and lesbian people in the community, and you need to address this. And so when they got to Chinatown, I guess the mayor of Chinatown guy says, look, we don't have any gay people in Chinatown. And so Crystal um, was just a young, I think she was an educator. She could lose her job. She st stood up and she said, my name is Crystal Jang. My parents are Esther and Homer Jang, and I'm a lesbian. And it just like brought the house down, and people were crying and coming up to her. And so she was the first one to like sta take a stand in the Chinese community. And it's just so important. She brought together the whole um, Asian community in one you know, as a, as a force in the gay and lesbian community within that. And Jewel Gomez, this is the fun fact cards that are in the book. They're like little baseball cards. She's a playwright of, uh, she does lesbian vampire novels and um, she does, you know, uh, James Baldwin inspired plays. She's fantastic. Uh, this is Di uh, the Dinah. Um, this is Mariah Hansen and what people don't know so much about her, I don't know if you know about the Dinah, it's the largest lesbian event in the, in the world, I guess. And um, zillions of lesbians descend on Las Vegas, uh, I mean, uh, Palm Springs once a year. And she has discovered acts like Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, she's the first one to have them out. And so she, that is really a big hot spot for culture. Um, Kate Kendall, who, uh, with, as the leader of NCLR, she, um, they are the ones that that brought um, gay marriage to be legal. They're the ones that fought the fight. Uh, this is an interesting one. This Diane Anderson Minshaw, she's a woman I worked with years ago. Um, and she had a, a partner, that, Susie, just kind of an average, kind of quiet gal. And then um, over the years, Susie transitioned to Jake. And Jake is this swaggering, handsome dude now. And they are still married all this time. And then, you know, this interests me because it begs the question, is she still a lesbian? Well. She thinks she is. I think she is. So she belongs in there. And this is Marga Gomez, who I got a, I heard that this spit take thing became like the most famous meme on the internet. And my son, the one in the video, called me up. Mommy, I keep seeing Marga on, on video. I mean, on, as a meme on, online. So she's managing to stay relevant. She also has a show right now in Berkeley called, um, I forget the name, but it's, um, it's really. Latin Standards, yeah, you should definitely go see that if you get a chance. It's playing there right now at the Marsh. It's fantastic. She plays her dad and her mom. And, and this is Jenny Olson, who is the um, person who started Planet Out. I don't know if you know about that. That was one of the very first websites that meant so much to all of us that are a little older. Um, 
it was the first place where you could have a hub of all things gay. And uh, my mom takes a look at this and says, is that a man? <laughs> and I say, no, it's, that's Jenny and she's cute. <laughs> okay, so what's next for Game Changers? Um, well, I'm hoping to get it into 267 more schools, which would serve an additional 20, two, over 200,000 students. And that, that means every county in the Bay Area, every public high school would get a, a book. And we put it, I, you know, I put it in the wellness centers and the libraries. I've heard from the wellness center people in, in my hometown how much it means to those kids to just walk in and like see that on the table because that's who's typically going into the wellness center, someone who's being bullied or feeling a little awkward. And if they can just pick this up and have it not be a big deal, it's huge. Um, and this is why it's so important because it's not just the gay kids that are going to benefit. It's the straight kids. It's like, gosh, I don't know. When I was little, we didn't have like a poster of... Um, we didn't have Black History Month. We didn't have Martin Luther King in every classroom, but now they have that. So like I was picturing soon, in a few years, they'll probably have a picture of Harvey Milk in every classroom, a poster, and that's all great, but like I wanna make sure the lesbians are included that did great things. Because women are always left out of stuff. And like history, history is always about the context with which you tell it. So now, oh, we lost it, ta-da. So the reasons that it's so great, obviously, is it reduces bullying, increases visibility, and fosters pride and dignity, like that girl who just was so touched that I brought it in. It just, it's so important for people to see themselves. Otherwise, it, you just feel invisible. So I'm just asking you guys to help spread the word today. And I have a sign-up sheet over there if you want to keep in touch. No. Hello? She asked if, if we, okay, she asked if we, if I faced any challenges when trying to distribute the books. And yes, um, I got a couple of books mailed back. And then, but mostly no, everyone was thrilled to get it. And I, I either mailed it or personally sent, uh, walked into these schools and gave it to them. And I got all the right names from some educator friends, so it was going to the right people. Hi. This isn't about your book, but your experience of the challenge of parenting in those situations, and do you have any advice on handling those situations where you have other parents that are not as open-minded? Oh, that's a really good question. And how you've navigated that over time? Uh, well, I, I can only think of an anecdote that's pretty funny. When my partner and I first moved to Marin, some parents said to me, oh, we always wanted a lesbian couple in our circle of friends. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, wow, that's, that's exciting. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I just, um, you know, my son is actually, my older son is a real big advocate for that. He'll, he'll say, he'll just say, oh, so you're against it? I mean, like, you think if I got hurt, my mom shouldn't be able to pick me up from the hospital? Like, like just point out real facts about the discrimination and I don't know, it's a hard one. It's very personal. I guess I tried to steer clear of it as much as I could and give my kid the tools to just be proud of himself by surrounding him by a positive environment and being proud. Like I'm really proud that both my kids are feminists. Like they just really get it about the discrimination and they, they consider themselves queer they're both straight, but they, um, they know they were raised by two women, and that has changed them. That has made them better men. I, I was thinking, oh, God, you're bringing two little white boys into the world. And, you know, at least they've got this thing that makes them understand that, you know, it's not the same level playing field for all of us. It's really important to know that. Anything else? You had another question? I did have another question. <laughs> Keep it going. I'm dominating this. OK. It's OK. Um, do, you, uh, do you have any recommendations for us if we want to approach schools as well to help distribute your book? Well, you could um, contact me afterwards. I would, love, I would love some help with that, especially when it comes to delivering it down here. I've applied for a couple grants, and I'm also looking for um, people to step up and, and help. So any way you can help, if it could be 
distributing and something like that would be fantastic. Or giving me the right people and yeah. So um, uh, you could sign up over here and I'll be sure to be in touch. I did have somebody ping me with a question, which is, first of all, thank you for being here. It's such an important uh, publication and for documenting our history. What are your thoughts on how millennials tend to identify more as queer, that the word lesbian could be fading from our lexicon? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I will say that when I came out and the women around my age, we didn't have a choice. It wasn't a choice of some version of queer. It was, it was you're a lesbian or you're not. Do you like women or not? And if we were going to choose that the harder way, you know, then we were going to claim it. And so now that it's become kind of an un-PC un word to use in general for the youth, um, I just have to question it. I got a lot of um, actually flack. Um, I got people emailing me saying, do you have to use that ugly word? Can't you just say queer? Uh, and I was like, no, because it's about the lesbians. I mean, that's the whole point. But um, it's an interesting part of history, and it will fade, and it is fading, and, and that's okay. It's just, um, it's important to at least understand why it was there, ha what happened, and, and why we have the freedoms that we have today to choose some version of, of gay, queer, whatever, Ron, fluid. You know, yes? I, my experience growing up in Toronto, when I started to try to tell people, I found it hard to say I was a lesbian, and I would say, you know, um, so I would say I'm gay. Like, there's something about the stigma of, of saying you're a lesbian, well, it, and you're it right. started from the beginning. Good point. So that, almost in a way, yeah. we're still not comfortable saying we're lesbians. Right. It's a, it's a misogynistic thought, if you really think through. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it so uncomfortable to talk about the woman part of the gay thing and identify strictly as that. And, and when, when the word gay is such a happy word and lesbians like, ugh. Yes. I, thank you so much. I really resonate with that. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's so interesting how there's, a, there's that little hurdle about lesbian. So I, I, you started asking what we were going to come to Halloween as. And I figured it out. I'm going to come as a, as a lesbian you should know. <laughs> oh, great. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about what my costume should look like. Well, I dressed as a lesbian once for Halloween, and I wore a very misshapen pillow here and then a big old fanny pack and a mullet. This was years ago. I can't believe I did that. <laughs> but that's different than lesbian you should know. Right, of course. Um, hmm. Well, you could maybe do Gertrude Stein, too. Where uh, you cut your Jane was your in a friend. play where she played Gertrude. She there was a play called All These Different Gertrudes, and Jane literally cut her hair for the part that night. I gave him the worst haircut Uber I've ever seen. Fringe. Okay, that's a deal breaker. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going as Amelia Earhart. Oh, nice. nice. Sweet. Well, we don't know about her. No, we have to wonder. There's some. There's some letters. Is there? Oh. Nice. There, was a, there was a man that was after her to marry him for a really long time. And she finally, she kept saying, no, 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 no. And then and there's all these letters back and forth about it. And she finally said at some point, she's like, listen, we all know that I'm not interested in this, but I can't take the pressure of expectation anymore. So if we're going to do this, you have to understand that I'm going to go do my own separate thing. Whoa. And then she was in a horrible plane accident. <laughs> didn't have to ever marry anybody. Wow, I wonder if that was rigged. Yeah. Whoa. Any Whoa. other questions? All right. Or thoughts? Let's thank Robin for coming today. Thanks. <laughs>